we thank you for this day and we thank you for calling us into worship. We thank you for the gift of prayer and that you pay attention to us. Little creatures on this small blue and green, green planet in a vast universe. So we thank you for your humility to pay attention to us, to hear our prayers. We pray that you would use this recording to help people to worship. And Lord, that as we create this, we pray that you would sharpen our minds, and strengthen our voices, and soften our hearts and help us to truly be worshipers, not just creating a video. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments to sit straight, pull your shoulders back, breathe deep, breathe slow. Take a few moments to hear God invite you into worship. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I will take a few moments just to confess any darkness that might be living inside of us right now. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways for the glory of your Lord. Amen. Mighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is Come Thou Haunt of Every Blessing.
harlots, and then her mouth shall proclaim her praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is our light and our life. O come, let us worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise the loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King of all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord is our light and our life. Oh, God, let us worship. I invite you to be seated for our first reading. <laughs> A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 19 to 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other night at all. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Thanks be to God. This is a reading from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while a weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, 
since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives, thank, gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, when, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king 
who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise be to you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand your word, and that your word will be planted deep in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we have these uh, fantastic readings this week. First, we have the Exodus reading. Uh, the Exodus reading is all about this. And over the weeks, we've seen God interacting with the Hebrew people who are in slavery in Egypt, and they're getting brought out. And today we heard, heard them getting brought through the sea and rescued from slavery in Egypt, going into the uh, going into the wilderness and towards the promised land. And this is a central story for the identity of who Israel is. And even for Christians, the way we frame Jesus rescuing us from sin, for example, is often about how Jesus rescues us from slavery in sin and brings us into, in a sense, the promised land, the kingdom of God. So it's, it's a central idea for, for Christians and for, for Jews as well. Um, and it'd be fun to do a, a sermon series on that sometime, that whole, that whole series of readings. And then in our gospel reading, we have a, an amazing passage as well. Uh, Peter comes to Jesus wondering when his responsibility to forgive someone ends. And it was a, a teaching at the time from some of the rabbis that if someone purposefully sins against you three times, you can be done with them. And you don't have to forgive them anymore. And Peter comes to him uh, doubling this number, more than doubling it, using the perfect number, seven, the number of completion, Peter's saying, do I have to forgive up to seven times? And Jesus says, no, 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 <laughs> way more than that. 70 times seven, or sometimes they translate it 77 times. The point is not to be counting how many times you're forgiving this person. And he tells a parable about this. He says that there's a king and the king has a servant and he's settling accounts with this servant. And the servant owes him 10,000 talents, it, Jesus says. And a talent, one talent, is worth 10 years wages for a common laborer. So 10,000 talents is like 150,000 years for a common laborer. So the point is, this is a super extravagant amount of money that can never be paid back. It's billions of dollars. And for to imagine a, a servant paying that back is, is ridiculous. So this is never going to get paid back. And the king forgives him. He says, your, your debt is forgiven. And the servant then goes out and sees another servant 
who owes him a hundred denarii. And one denarius was basically a day's, uh, a day's pay for a, a laborer. And so he owes him a hundred denarii. So that's a little less than a third of a year's wages, which so it's significant, but it's, ac it's actually payable. He could actually do it. And this servant who'd been forgiven these billions of dollars comes up and demands payment and is unwilling to forgive the debt. And the servants obviously have a problem with this and tell the king. And the king says that if he was shown mercy, he should show mercy to others. And Jesus is saying, this is God, right? So us, the way we have been forgiven is totally unpayable. The way offending a holy and perfect God creates an unpayable debt. And God has forgiven us that debt through Christ. And so shouldn't we then be willing to forgive these little things that people do to us? That's the teaching. Right? Uh, that if we are shown tremendous mercy by God, that we should be willing to show mercy to others. It's a beautiful passage and I don't want to uh, pass it by without saying something about it. But that's actually not what I wanted to preach on today. I want to preach on this reading from, uh, reading from Romans. Uh, it's a, it, it's a really important passage, I think as well. And that's really what I wanted to focus on. Um, the early church had to hold an incredible amount of diversity together. It was a movement that was supposed to transcend the barriers that usually separated people. And we see this in Galatians 5, where he talks about rich and poor, men and women, old and young, Jew and Gentile. These are, all these differences were transcended in Christ. We're all one in Christ. And so uh, amazingly, and this is in terms of human history, this is an incredible teaching that we are no longer to be divided in these ways. And so a new humanity has been birthed through Christ and we are now having to try to live practically this new way, this, as these new people in this new kingdom. And it's a lot of work to try to practically live that out. And that was the case for the early church and it's still a lot of work for us today. Uh, so say, for example, you grew up in a Jewish home you never eat pork. You have never eaten pork. It has never been on your table. And not only that, you have never sat at a table with someone who doesn't follow the kosher dietary laws. So for example, you've never sat at table with someone who um, has eaten pork. You've never, the kosher diet included who you ate with in that culture. And so you become a follower of Jesus, and Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, right? So this should be a Jewish movement. And then you're all of a sudden eating with these non-Jewish people, and these non-Jewish people are still eating pork. And not only that, they're eating pork that they probably got from the market, and the market got it from pagan temple sacrifices. Uh, in the, that's often where meat was was um, was. That's where you got your meat often in the markets. Um, and eating kosher is only a part of that picture as well. So there are these Jewish festivals that are outlined in the Bible. They are festivals that Jesus participated in and, and practiced. There's the mark of circumcision, which marked you as a part of the, the covenant of Abraham. Uh, it, it's a mark that Jesus himself had. And so now... You're in a church. Imagine yourself as a Jewish. You grew up Jewish. You're in a church now that includes non-Jewish people who aren't eating kosher, who aren't celebrating the traditional festivals, and who aren't circumcised if they're male. And say some of the Jewish Christians that are in your church stop eating kosher and stop following the festivals. And what would you think? What does it feel like to be a part of that community as a Jewish person uh, who now believes in, the, the, in Jesus? 
wouldn't part of you feel like this community is encouraging people to be less faithful to the teachings of the Bible uh, and less faithful to the traditional ways of God's people? After all, these are the things that Jesus did. Jesus celebrated these festivals. Jesus was circumcised. Jesus ate kosher. Why should this community all of a sudden ignore all of that? And for others, so on the other side of the spectrum, there's others who said, you know what? Jesus gave us this teaching. Like in Mark 7, we read, there's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. To them, it didn't matter about food. It mattered about the inner recesses of your hearts. So what, what is going on inside your heart? Don't worry about what you're eating. Worry about what's going on in your heart. Are you a kind person? Are you wrathful? Are you forgiving? Like these are the things that they, maybe they matter a bit more. And so it'd be easy for someone who is thinking that way, who says that it doesn't matter what we eat, to look down on someone and say, you know, if you're worried about all this food and these festival days, it, it seems a bit superficial. You know, it seems a bit shallow. Why do you care about what piece of skin I have cut off on my, on my body? Why does that matter? Shouldn't it matter more about forgiveness and love and the way that um, sin has, it has a place in my heart? You know, cut that out. Don't worry about cutting off a piece of flesh. Don't worry about what I'm eating. So you can see how these groups would kind of clash a little bit, right? And we obviously have these kinds of problems in the church even now. Uh, so take music, for example. There's the older hymns, these old majestic hymns. They have majestic poetry and they have profound theology and they have a little more complicated uh, musical notation. They're songs that have lasted the test of time and they have shaped worship for the church through many, many, many years. So they are established and important as a part of our tradition. And they look at someone who's loving the old hymns. They might look at some of the new songs and they think that they're maybe a little bit shallow. They're musically simplistic. They are repetitive, both musically and theologically. And sometimes maybe they're not theologically beefy enough in their their poetry and those who like the newer music well they they say well it can it speaks more to contemporary modern life it, it uses modern language it, it's more upbeat it ha has more of an emotional impact uh, for your, the, the average person coming in off the street and the repetition of the words allow those words to sink a little bit deeper into your heart and into your soul so you can you can think about them rather than constantly being confronted with new thoughts and, uh, and even archaic vocabulary that we no longer use anymore that we can sometimes find in the older hymns. Uh, to them, the older hymns are often boring. Um, they can be hard to relate to. They can feel like dirges sometimes. And so we can disagree about music in this, this kind of a way, even as they argued about meat and uh, festivals and uh, circumcision. And we disagree about even prayer, um, which is better, written prayers or spontaneous prayer. You know, written prayers, people can spend hours crafting these prayers for the intercessions. And, um, and people can, uh, maybe somebody's not value that as being not as spontaneous or not as, you know, authentic, even though they've spent hours preparing this and praying over this. And then someone can get up and do spontaneous prayer and uh, sometimes they stumble over their language and sometimes they have these repetitive words like uh, like the word just is often often used a lot in, in, some, in spontaneous prayer in some circles. Um, you know, for example, they might pray, uh, God, I just thank you and I just want to come to you that like this kind of uh, way that we use our language sometimes can be a little funny and and not always all that prayerful. <laughs> so, but there can be this, these two camps where people can not like the, the, those particular ways of prayer. And sometimes we'll disagree about the liturgy that way. Should it be formal or should it be informal? Uh, if it's informal, it's more like a family gathering, um, more like Jesus as our uh, 
as our friend that we're gathered for supper together at a dinner party. And if it's more formal, it's like we've come before our holy king, the, the, the one who is um, the one we, we bow our wills to and we, we learn from. And so there can be a, a difference of opinion about uh, what, what the liturgy should be like. And now we're dealing with COVID and all the, our responses to it. And there can be all kinds of differences about that as well. And we might have this kind of weak and strong thing happening there where you have somebody who is saying, you know what, I'm not afraid uh, of COVID and there's worse things than to die for a Christian. And they might look down on someone who is, a, is worried and, um, and so as being maybe lacking faith or something like that. So, and you can, and then you could see other people sort of saying, well, you're not obeying the government. And, the, you know, that's in Romans 13. We should be following the government. So there's all kinds of reasons for church members to, to disagree with one another um, and to, to have different opinions on different things. And there are some things that we absolutely should agree on as Christians. There are some core elements to being a Christian. There are some essentials. And there are some things that help us discern this person is a Christian and this person is not a Christian. And that's perfectly okay. That's not, it's just definition of terms. So for example, I would say that belief in God is pretty essential to being a Christian. Uh, belief in Jesus as a historical person is, I think, pretty essential to being a Christian. Um, and I would say the belief in the resurrection is um, essential and, and the authority of the Bible to guide our lives is essential. Um, and I'd say there's a few moral elements as well, moral decisions that are essential for Christians that uh, should define us as even if we don't always follow them, we also say this is the ideal for the Christian life. And uh, there should be and. Of course, there's gray elements, but there should be some very specific uh, elements that we all agree on in, in that world as well. And of course, deciding which elements are essential, which ones aren't essential, that's a whole different, a whole different ballgame. Uh, it gets tricky. And, um, but Paul's point here is clear. He's saying that there are some things that we should agree on as Christians that are absolutely central, and there are other gray areas that we don't have to agree on. A Christian proverb that I like it when thinking about this says, and it's been in circulation for hundreds of years, is in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Right? So we should be united in all those things that are essential. If there are things like music and liturgical style, those things, we should have some freedom around that. And we should be charitable in trying to in how we talk about people who differ from us in, uh, in those choices. And Paul says this, he says, welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. It's Romans 14, 1 to 3. So, and Paul obviously has an opinion on this matter. He says so. He seems to see the strong faith person as being the one who isn't bothered by the food laws. That they, Like Jesus says, you can put whatever you want in your mouth, but that's not what makes you unclean. And the weak faith person as being the one who's keeping the food laws. So he's keeping to these the Torah traditions and the traditions of the people. Paul, in a sense, agrees that that's a little bit shallow. We're, we're trying to aim at something a little bit deeper here. But it's interesting that he doesn't sort of condemn them. Paul doesn't say that uh, they should be thrown out of the church or anything like that. He says that there should be room for a difference of opinion. And Paul doesn't make his own opinion the rule for the church, which is very interesting. He's actually giving them both a bit of a warning. He's saying, don't consider the food laws. Those who don't consider the food laws important anymore should not despise those who still follow the food laws. And similarly, 
the person who follows the food laws shouldn't judge the person who doesn't eat kosher as somehow not taking the biblical law seriously or as being unwilling to set themselves apart from, from the culture. And later in chapter 14, we read, if your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause ruin of one whom Christ, for whom Christ died. It's like you're scandalizing them by, by what you eat. And then in the next chapter, Paul says, we who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. That's Romans 15, 1 to 2. So what Paul is saying here is that we have an obligation to one another. Our freedom is not to be selfishly used for our own gratification. We don't use our freedom to rub it in the faces of those who disagree with us. So imagine it's like this. Imagine you go up to dinner with a friend who is a recovering alcoholic. You have the freedom to drink wine at that meal. But should you? Are you going to use your freedom to in a sense, harm or challenge or cause this friend to stumble? Is it right for you to have the, the alcohol? You absolutely have the freedom to do so, but should your freedom be used in that kind of a selfish way when you know that it might be a problem for the person, for your friend? Paul might say that if you do have the wine and the other person is bothered by what you drink, you are no longer walking in love. Uh, that's Romans 14, 15. So those who have, a f have freedom have an obligation to bear with those who are bothered, whose conscience is more fragile. They should not use their freedom to offend others. And we are swimming in consumerism and individualism as a culture. Um, and it means that we often want to have things our way and we have a tendency to emphasize my rights. But what Paul is saying here is he's trying to emphasize our responsibility to others, to care for them, to love them, to build them up and not crush them by misusing our freedom. So whatever it is that we think divides us, it cannot be allowed to be more powerful than our unity in Christ. We dare not insert new divisions when Christ has transcended so many to bring us together. When we are not dealing with essentials, whatever our sister or brother thinks will honor the Lord, we should give them the freedom to do so. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments to contemplate what God is saying to you through these readings. Confess our faith as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived. 
conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And our offering him is where charity and love prevail. For our intercessions today, our supplication would be, Lord, in your mercy, and the response would be, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord of all, we pray for the welfare of your worldwide church. Guide and govern it by your good spirit, so that all who call themselves Christians may be led in the way of truth, and justice and faith. And Lord, as we continue to navigate uncharted territory during this pandemic, as we search for new ways to come together as God's family, please help our church body walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have given us. Help us in all our interactions with one another to have humble and gentle hearts. Grant us patience with each other bearing each other up in love. We ask that you clothe our leaders in the armor of God and imbue them with the wisdom, strength, and knowledge as they strive to make the best decisions for your flock, both spiritually and physically. Today we pray for the Anglican Church of South America and for our companion diocese of the Windward Islands. We pray for the Diocese of Calgary and all the parishes under its guidance. We pray for Greg, our Metropolitan and Bishop, Linda, our Primate, and for Pilar and all the Synod office staff. In the Red Deer area, we raise up the Potter's Hands Ministry. In our own parish of St. Leonard's, we bring before you our Reverend Chris, 
and all who assist him in strengthening, maintaining, and growing the spiritual bonds of our church. In the households of St. Leonard's and St. Paul, we raise before you the families of Mike and Val Frank, Robert Freeman, and Beryl Friedenberg. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wisdom and truth, we beseech you to bless all who teach in our schools. Grant them the spirit of wisdom and grace as they guide our students through the new normal of the school experience. We ask you to keep our teachers and students safe and healthy and forever in your sight and under your wing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, whose son Jesus Christ went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease. Grant to the physicians, nurses, and all who labor on the front lines of our health and essential services, the wisdom, skill, and patience needed. Send down your blessing on all who labor to prevent suffering and who keep us healthy and safe and fed each day. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Most merciful God, we ask you to wrap your arms around our brothers and sisters in our church family and those known only to us who are experiencing anxiety and distress and who are going through difficult times, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In hospital, we pray for Norma, and Ada, and far in our parish, Jim, Karen and Colin, Elaine, Susan and Don, Marion, Vigo and Joan, Grace, Murray, and Jean. We also pray for Lena, Velvet Spring, Andrew, Des, Naya and Dom, Denise, McKenna N, Carol, Junior, Addison, Jody, Pat, Carly, Sandra, Kerry, and Gerald. And for any whose burdens we carry in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion and caring, we lift up prayers for peoples everywhere affected by natural and man-made disaster, political upheaval, and religious terrorism. We pray for all the vulnerable members of our community and for all who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, financially, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We also remember those affected by the devastating wildfires. We ask that you help them all in healing and rebuilding and that they may find some modicum of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Eternal and living God, we ask you to wrap your loving arms around all who continue to grieve the loss of a loved one especially at that time when celebrations of our loved ones' lives continue to be challenging. We trust our loved ones to your care. When sorrow and grief darken our lives, help us to look up to you and know that they are at peace in your glorious presence. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. In closing, Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. You have promised that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their requests. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us. For you alone know the plans you have made for each of us. You know the need that all have and have heard each prayer. Save us in your merciful loving kindness and eternal love. 
Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Almighty God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may turn to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And our general thanksgiving. Almighty God, God Father, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our final hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you.